I don't know about you, but I am certain that I have spent a great deal of time these past days, these past weeks, these past months, even these past years, reflecting on leadership, on what it means to be one who claims the name of God and who steps forward in moments given to bear witness to a power that is not our own. We've moved through the day in which this nation celebrates the life of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And while I was on vacation and not able to be preaching that Sunday, there is a way in which the witness of Dr. Martin Luther King has formed so deeply what I understand it to mean to stand in faith. I read someone who said, Dr. King, of course, did not do everything right. But one of the powerful parts about his faith witness was the endurance with which he stood for a struggle his whole life and repeatedly yielded himself to death, to the ways in which God would use him. I think back on this last week. It gives me great joy to be in a nation where we, the people, can choose to elect a vice president, Asian and African American woman for the first time. It fills my heart with joy to be in a moment such as this. And as I think back over the last two weeks, I'm grateful for those in leadership who have an taken an oath, pressured hard on every side, chose at great, probably political cost, to stand for the oath they took in integrity and not yield to the pressure around. What does it mean to be one who stands in faith? What does it mean to spend our lives preparing for moments like the moment that Elijah entered onto the Mount Carmel and saw 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah and said, I'm the only one. But we can no longer continue to be divided of heart like this. Today we will choose the God that we will serve. When you think of your own life journey and those powerful moments in time and history that you could not possibly sculpt, when you think about how you will stand in to the opportunity given to you, do you ever think about how we might prepare in advance for such a time as this? Those moments can be great moments of public witness when all eyes are on you, when you and I step into a role or an authority that we could not possibly have the strength to hold the depth that has brought us to that place. Or they can be smaller, seemingly moments, like moments when your children ask you important questions that you know in that moment count for eternity, count for what they will see the rest of their lives. How will you and I stand in those moments that are given to us? What about moments of grief or crisis? Moments when without ever asking or wanting, the world comes crashing in upon you or upon me, and we are given in that moment the opportunity to stand forward in faith or to shrink in fear. Moments when your partner needs you, when it's clear that you are leading in that moment to be the voice of grace, to be the voice of hope, to be the voice of strength. How do we prepare to stand into moments such as these. Part of this sermon series that we're living into is based upon a resource that I am personally using, written by Priscilla Schreier, entitled Elijah, Faith and Fire. And one of the things that she suggests that I think is fundamentally important as we look at leadership is how often we have this tendency to put leaders on a pedestal, 
She asks in one of the early sections of the study, who is it that you respect in faith? If you were to have to name the people that lead you, the people that you look to, who do you think of? I must confess to you, I was a little bit astounded that I don't have that many names that I would lift up. But do you have those over the course of history or even now that you look to as leaders in faith, as those who exemplify the Spirit of God? Do you have the voice of Elijah or the voice of Paul that points to who we can become in the name of Jesus? Priscilla Schreier goes on, to say, and I believe this deeply, sometimes we tend to put the biblical figures on pedestals or even the great preachers or pastors or spiritual leaders on pedestals, believing that somehow, like the crowds gathered around Paul and Barnabas, they must be gods, Greek gods, Hermes or Zeus. They must be something other than mere mortals. But James reminds us, Elijah, was a human being just like us. Priscilla Schreier suggests that when we put them on ped pedestals, we get ourselves off the hook believing that there is no need for us to step into leadership because there are other great leaders called for such a moment as this. But what if the question your child asks you God has been preparing your heart for years to step into. What if your church needs your leadership? You are called to step into a moment such as this. What if God is not interested in mere mortals on pedestals, but rather calling each of us deeply, like Elijah, to stand in faith and to stand in fire? I find it interesting that Elijah the prophet is described to us as coming from the hill country of Gilead. In the nine o'clock service, I had Eric play the hymn, There is a Balm in Gilead. If we don't know the context, we lose sight of what God is saying here. See, Elijah is from one of those rough and rugged places, maybe those hardest places that you have walked from. It's believed that Elijah was probably one who tended sheep similar to David, who went on to take on Goliath, like Elijah took on the prophets of Baal. Elijah was from this rugged place called Gilead, and God intentionally used the places of roughness, the places where he had walked alone, the places where he had to rely on God to pull him up, to place him in leadership, that he would speak to King Ahab. Do you know King Ahab was reigning over Israel about 80 years after King Solomon? And if we remember from 2 Chronicles 7, that amazing scripture, Destiny, I know you know this, the place in which Solomon prays and the temple is literally filled with the Spirit of God in such a tangible and thick way that the ministers of worship don't fit. There is no room for anything else but the thickness of the Spirit of God and the people fall on their faces humbled before God. That was King Solomon. Oh, in just eight Generations later, or eight decades later, 80 years later, and we stand with the king who had done the greatest evil in the sight of the Lord. And all Elijah is doing is calling back the people of Israel, choose this day who you will serve. Choose this day who you declare to be your God. He came from Gilead, rough and rugged, God used every hard place he had come from, used him to stand against King Ahab. But do not miss that immediately when he stands in power and authority, because this often happens when we step into calling, we start to believe that it's all about us, all eyes on us, all to be held by us. God says, you speak the word and you go to Wadi Cherith. You wait 
till I fill that riverbed with water and you drink, that you would always remember. As Paul and Barnabas said, it is not about us, but it is about the God that is within us. We can tend to put people on pedestals and believe that Elijah's witness has nothing to do with us. But in James, we hear in a very commonplace description of how we are called to be together. If you're suffering, pray. If you're cheerful, sing songs of praise. If you're sick, ask others and the elders to pray for you. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another. Be healed and believe always that the prayer of the righteous is powerful. Did didn't Elijah, he just said. How many of us would prefer not to step into leadership now? Not to say anything, not to do anything, to remain in the shadows. The pandemic makes it somewhat easier. Hide in your house, hide in your room. Don't engage. And yet God is calling. Priscilla Schreier suggests that there are four ways in which God begins to prepare Elijah. And maybe, Sophia, you can put those four on the screen share for just a second. There's four powerful ways in which God begins to move in Elijah's life, and they are things that can easily translate to us. The four are as follows. God begins to build Elijah's faith. God begins to build Elijah's courage. God begins to build a bold witness to Christ in Elijah. And God begins to show Elijah how much stronger he is in prayer. Build your faith. Build your courage. Build a bold witness to Christ and strengthen your life in the power of prayer. And do not wait until the moment that you are called to stand forward to start because it will probably be too late. You can stop sharing, Sophia. The first, build faith. Build faith in such a way that you recognize along with me that the ability to see what is not always visible is foundational to the ability to step in to the moment you are called to speak. Elijah sent his servant seven times after what happened on Mount Carmel to look for rain clouds in the sky, and the servant came back and said, there's just a teeny tiny one. Elijah says, that's it. Build your faith. Build your faith to see what is not yet visible. Build your faith to believe that God is not finished yet. Build your faith so that in the valleys you may see the mountaintops to which God is leading you. Hebrews 11, 13 to 16, after recounting all of the forefathers and mothers in faith, says all of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw the promises and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on this earth, for people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking about the land they left behind, they would have had an opportunity to return. But they desired a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, God has prepared a city for them. Build your faith. In what is not immediately visible, build your faith knowing that you stand in a legacy of people who have opened doorways and created opportunities for such a time as this. Build your faith in what you see in the future and what you understand of the past, even when you stand in the present right now. Priscilla Schreier says, to build our faith, we must not focus on our comfort. It's hard today, God. I don't want to continue. Don't focus on your comfort. Lean in to your calling. The second thing that happened in the life of Elijah is that his courage was built. The interesting thing about courage is if we wait until the moment 
when we are called to be courageous, when we need to speak the truth, when we are called to step up, to make a hard decision, if we wait until that moment to practice courage, we've probably waited too long. But the question then becomes, how do we build our courage? Priscilla Schreier says, be less concerned with public perceptions and most concerned with God. And we think, of course, duh, but how much of our heart life is invested in what somebody else said, in what somebody else thinks, in what somebody else will do? Build your courage. Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 talks about the fact that he did not come proclaiming the mystery of God in lofty words or wisdom, but decided rather to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Christ crucified. I came to you in weakness and in fear and in trembling, and my speech was not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit of power so that in verse 5, Faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Whose opinion matters most as you build your courage? What do we teach our children whose voices get priority? Whose voices do we allow the greatest volume in our own home? The third call in Elijah's life was a call to bold witness. And who among us doesn't want to have a witness? Who among us doesn't want to have a legacy to stand in? Who among us doesn't want to have something to stand up into? But Luke 21 is the very words of Jesus that says, but before all this occurs, remember they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and governors. Before my name, you will, given, you will be given an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to, to withstand. You will be betrayed by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you will be put to death. You will be hated, all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your soul. How many of us want a witness for Christ, but we want it to be easy. I'm not suggesting that we are called to be modern day martyrs. I'm suggesting that God through Christ is telling us clearly, stepping in to your calling, stepping in to your baptismal call to be a witness to Christ will not put you in easy places. But not a hair on your head will perish. And God will hold your soul if you are willing to become a witness for him. Finally, strengthen your power in prayer. Elijah showed this in such a powerful way. And God didn't even give him a choice. God said, speak to the king and disappear. Disappear to that barren place where I will give you water and the ravens will bring you bread and pray to me that you would eat from every word that comes from my mouth. Pray. Pray such that you are strengthened in power so that in the moment when you are called in your marriage to stand in hard times, you don't just start praying then. You've been praying for years before. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, whenever you pray, don't be like the hypocrites that stand and pray in the synagogues. God never reads my heart for what I pray on this altar. God reads my heart for who I am when nobody's watching. Pray in such a way that you would be strengthened so that when you are called to call upon the Spirit of the Lord, God finds you a faithful vessel through which God's spirit may move. Preparing for the moments that God uses us and believing that it's not just up to Elijah and the modern day political leaders and the Martin Luther Kings. It's up to us. It is part of our baptismal calling 
that we build our faith and our courage and our witness to Christ and we strengthen ourselves in prayer. I want to close by telling you about this young man, Andele Buunu Nkube, born in Harare, Zimbabwe, a member of Epworth for multiple years, and yet I believe most of you would not recognize his face. 34 years of age, he was found deceased in his apartment at the end of December, and his funeral was yesterday. I learned an incredible amount about his life and about what God is teaching us yesterday. The first thing I want you to know is that Andale's family was very open about his encounters with mental illness later in life. In his mid-twenties, he was diagnosed and struggled hard. He was a young man who had studied at Liberty University, a man who loved wrestling. Makes me think of Jacob wrestling with the angel, forever blessed and walking with a limp. But if you knew Andale, there was a spirit of God about him that was undeniable. And the thing that touched my heart so profoundly was his aunt who stood up in his funeral yesterday and said, Andale lived with me for one year. And I have to tell you, I've never encountered anyone like Andale for one year. If I ever spoke ill of anyone, Andale took my words and turned them that even in my not so nice words, there would be positivity that he would find. And every time I sought to speak ill of someone else, Andale would say to me, Auntie, don't do that. Don't do that. And would redirect the energy. The powerful thing for me is that as I was preparing to preach in his funeral, the scripture that God gave to me was again from James, though not the scripture that Joanne read. It was James in which James is speaking about the call not to slander one another, rather that God opposes the proud, but blesses the humble and will lift them up. See, true leadership doesn't lift itself up. True leadership builds faith and courage and witness and is humbled in prayer like those ministers of worship in Second Chronicles. And God raises up faith and fire to be a witness to him. The family, Andale's family, started what they're calling the Andale Challenge, and I have invited my family to do this. The Andale Challenge is simply 30 days of not saying anything ill about anyone else. Try it for a day. It is not easy. 30 days of choosing to guard your mouth such that God would form your heart. 30 days being reminded that a young man who wrestled with mental illness was building a witness to Christ in a way that the world doesn't recognize leadership, but God does. For such a time as this, what is God calling from you? Are you so focused on your comfort that you're unwilling to build your faith and stand in your calling? Are you so afraid of what the world would say? Are the voices of others so strong that you cannot build your courage to stand for God? Are you so caught up in fame and power and in yourself that you bear a witness to you and not to the God who lifts up the humble? And is your prayer life such that you are building the resources you will need for the moment that your child needs you in a way that they have never needed you before? For the moment that your partner needs you to be the one that stands as an armor bearer to their heart? For the moment that your church needs you? 
for the moment that your nation creates a space for you to step in, will we be people of faith and fire? I close with this. Priscilla Schreier says that so often we see folks like Martin Luther King and Elijah and Andale, maybe, and we want that testimony. We want that witness. It's like a beautiful ballerina's foot, laced in a satin slipper, pointed, the symbol of poise and strength and grace. And when you take that slipper off, it's filled with gauze stuck to loose skin and bruises and hard work and years of practice. We want the glory, the Mount Carmel, fire and faith of Elijah. The ability, like Paul, to look at a man and see that he wanted healing and to call him up in the name of God. We want the witness of one like Andale who can silence the voices of negativity. But are we willing to put in the hard work to build our faith and our courage and our witness and our prayer? This world needs a church that chooses, not red or blue, not Republican or Democratic, not the witness of hate and the frenzy of words that exist right now. This world needs a church who knows upon whose name every power rests. And that only happens when we are humbled that God would raise us up to the calling that each one of us has. Mm -hmm.